Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight. We are working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we are in Exodus chapter 33. So as always, we want to invite you to be finding a copy of the Bible on your own and joining us in Exodus chapter 33. We'll be there in just a minute. But if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's something that we can be praying about, if there's any way that we can help you or encourage you, we hope that you'll get in touch. Uh, send me a message message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Exodus. So by way of 30-second review, we know that God's people are free from slavery in Egypt. They have crossed over the Red Sea. They have received the law at Mount Sinai. But of course, while Moses was up on the mountain, they uh, made and they worshiped a golden calf. And then when Moses came down from the mountain, he smashed the tablets, he ground up the golden calf into dust, and he made the people drink it. And on that day, at Moses' command, we know from the previous chapter that the Levites killed 3,000 men with the sword as punishment for what they had done. And at the end of Exodus 32, as we studied it last week, God basically tells Moses that he must now get up and go. Uh, leading the people out into the wilderness from Mount Sinai. So that brings us up to where we are now in Exodus chapter 33. So we are picking up tonight with the first paragraph, Exodus chapter 33, verses 1, 2, and 3. Exodus 33, 1, 2, and 3. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. So again, God tells Moses that it is now time to leave Mount Sinai. It's now time to start moving toward the land that God first promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So these people are the descendants in that original promise, and it's time to move toward the land. And God now explains that he has assigned an angel to go ahead before them to make it happen. Angels, of course, are very powerful creatures. They were created to serve God. And the angel is assigned to get this done. And so God promises here to drive out the inhabitants of the land. He names them here. And he promises that the people will be given this land flowing with milk and honey. However, and this is a huge however, God also explains that he, that is God, will not be going with them. And the reason given is that the people are obstinate. In other words, they are incredibly stubborn. And as I read this, God is concerned that if he goes with them, he may decide to destroy them along the way. And that's a rather a strange passage, isn't it? Uh, it's almost as if God is worried that he might not be able to control himself, that he may have this outburst of anger along the way. And I don't think that's really what's going on here. That's the way it seems. In reality, God wants his people to make it to the promised land. They are his people. He loves them. He wants what's best for them. But he also knows that these people are incredibly stubborn. And so it seems to me that God is saying that he's going to step out of it for a moment here, uh, maybe just temporarily. And so he's sending his angel on as a representative at this point. So this is the plan that is announced to Moses here. So let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 33, verses 4, 5, and 6. Exodus 33, 4 through 6. When the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning, and none of them put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Well, Moses shares God's announcement to the people. He announces that God is not going with them. And they go into mourning over this. And this looks like something that God has asked for. If you remember, they had already removed quite a bit of their jewelry to make the golden calf. They ended up drinking it. 
And so now they take off the rest of their jewelry, not to make a calf with, but the opposite of that. This is a sign of mourning over God's announcement that he wouldn't uh, be traveling with them since they were so stubborn. So it's almost like they're trying to convince God that they really aren't stubborn at all. You know, and uh, so they're, they're proving this by removing their jewelry like a sign of mourning. And when we think back to God's comments to Moses, I think we're reminded that God not going with them is in fact tied to their stubbornness. And so just as God's blessings can be conditional, uh, so also negative consequences are conditional. These two things go together. There is a positive, there is a negative, there are consequences in both directions. And the people have now removed their ornaments to try to show God how unstubborn they are, if that's a word. Well, let's continue with Exodus 33, verses 7 through 11, the next paragraph. Exodus 33, verses 7 through 11. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship, each at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, I'll admit that uh, this is not the picture that I had in mind concerning the layout of the camp. I know several weeks ago, I believe we looked at a passage where we had the tabernacle was supposed to be in the middle, and the 12 tribes were surrounding it, almost like uh, uh, several on each side, like spokes from a wheel going out uh, into the distance. But notice here we have the tent being pitched outside the camp. In fact, it's a good distance from the camp, and Moses leaving the camp to actually go out to seek the Lord. And I may not have the perfect answer. We may not have every detail here. It may be related to what we just learned from the first paragraph in this chapter, that God actually separated himself from the people for a while uh, due to their sin with the golden calf. And I, I think there is a better explanation. If you have another one, um, let me know. But I think something else is coming right here in this paragraph. Uh, but this is what we know right at this moment. So at this time in Israelite history, right here and now, uh, Moses would pitch the tent of meeting outside the camp. And of course, the other thing to consider here is that the tabernacle hadn't been built yet, had it? We have the instructions, but we don't actually have the construction happening. And I think this is probably what's going on here. The tent of meeting in this passage is not the tabernacle. I think sometimes the tabernacle may be referred to as the tent of meeting later on, but I don't think these are the same, um, not buildings, but uh, places or tents. There's two different tents. So it seems to me maybe they had some kind of tent where they would meet with God, maybe this uh, kind of early uh, predecessor to the tabernacle. So maybe they had some kind of uh, tent going on here that was not the tabernacle yet since that hadn't been built yet. And this particular tent was actually set up outside the camp. So the passage we read earlier concerning the tabernacle being built, or uh, the uh, design at least being in the middle, that was the instruction. That was the arrangement that God intended, uh, but that had not actually been implemented yet. And I think that's why this paragraph says that Moses used to do it this way. Uh, that would be in the early days of their journey before they actually constructed the tabernacle. But again, uh, let me know if you have this uh, definitively figured out for sure and uh, let me know. But that's kind of what I'm thinking at this point. This is before the tabernacle was actually constructed. And at that point, they actually had some kind of tent of meeting. Uh, that uh, they would put outside the camp where they could meet God. Well, the rest of this paragraph explains that when Moses would go to meet God in this tent, that the people would stand at a distance and watch. In fact, they would stay at the entrance to their own tents. Apparently, they would worship there with their families. And they were kind of at a distance looking on in awe at what was happening. So the cloud would come down. God would meet with Moses. And when Moses came back to the camp, Joshua, his assistant, would kind of station himself there at the tent in Moses' absence, almost like a guard or a bouncer kind of protecting that tent of meeting. Well, let's pick up tonight with Exodus 33, verses 12 through 16. Exodus 33, 12 through 16. 
Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face, who are upon the face of the earth? Well, we now come back to this idea that God would not be going with them. And Moses objects. Like, this is not okay. Very respectfully, but Moses has an issue with this. This is not all right. So Moses makes his case. He intercedes. And we saw this after the golden calf incident when God wanted to destroy the nation and start over with Moses. But Moses uh, appealed on behalf of the people and changes God's mind, if you remember that. And now we see it again here. So uh, Moses goes to God. He starts by reminding God who he is, who Moses is. You know, hello, it's me, Moses. And Moses explains that he and God have a relationship. And so in verse 13, he comes to the request, at least the first part of it anyway, as Moses is asking to know God so that he can find favor in God's sight. In other words, please Help me out here. I need to know who you are. And it's almost like two people getting to know one another. It's almost like a marriage relationship. And the rest of the request then is that if God doesn't go with them, then please just let us stay right here. There's really no point in us leaving if you're not going with us. So if you're not going with us, um, this trip is not worth making. That's the way I see that this at least. So God's presence with his people is really what makes them a people. It's what makes them distinct. If they're not distinct, if they don't have the presence of God with them, then they might as well just stay right where they are because they're pretty much like any other nation on the face of the earth. They are not distinct. They are not holy as God has said that they are. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph with God's response to Moses. This is Exodus 33, verses 17 through 23. Exodus 33, 17 through 23. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So the Lord then responds to Moses' prayer, doesn't he? And he grants his request. In other words, God was not going with him but now he will be going with them. And so we have this reminder yet again in this chapter that prayer changes things. Prayer has a way of changing God's mind. If it didn't, then prayer would be absolutely ridiculous. Prayer would be pointless. But as it is, prayer does have the power to change the outcome of a situation. Now, of course, we understand today God may not fix some problem that we pray about. He may answer the prayer in a way that we never expected. He may just be with us through the problem that we're facing. He may delay in answering the prayer. I mean, there are many possibilities here. But as God's people, we have a special relationship with God when he listens to our prayers. And we've got a relationship that people in the world do not have. And so in this case, God changes his mind on this. And because Moses intercedes, he has this respect for Moses. And God decides that he will, in fact, go with his people after all. And in response, it's almost as if Moses wants some kind of a confirmation. You know, I need a receipt for uh, you saying that you're going to answer this prayer. So he wants God to show him his glory. 
And God answers, but here it's not exactly how Moses might have been expecting, is it? So yes, God will do something. He will display his goodness to Moses. He's going to proclaim his name before Moses. He will display his compassion before Moses. But whatever happens, God's appearance will be at least somewhat muted. It's not going to get the full thing. He's not going to get all of the glory of God. And, and God is doing this for Moses' benefit. For no one can see me and live, God says. Now, of course, earlier in this chapter, we had God and Moses communicating face to face. So as I understand that, there really doesn't need to be a, a contradiction here. That might have been symbolic. That might have been a description of the relationship that they had, like they were talking as friends. There was communication going on, not necessarily that God exposed his actual face to Moses. That's not necessarily what happened there. So it might have been some form of God and not God in his full and awesome glory. I mean, Moses could not have handled that according to this passage. And so here instead, kind of as an alternative, uh, God points out this place nearby. So there is a cleft in the rock. I don't think we often say cleft today. That's not the way we talk. So a crack. There's a little crack in the rock, and God will have Moses hide in that crack while his glory passes by behind him, and Moses will be covered by God's hand. So God will cover Moses with his hand as he passes by. And then God will remove his hand after he's passed by, and God will allow Moses to see his back as he passes by. But God's actual face will not be seen. So it's a very interesting passage. It's uh, quite different from God's first introduction to Moses back at the burning bush. There are some similarities, though. God's uh, holiness is emphasized. So this brings us to the end of Exodus 33. And if you didn't notice, I, I think all of us, uh, most of us should understand and remember, uh, we've got a song based on that last passage written by Fanny Crosby, don't we? Uh, Fanny Crosby was uh, blind. And most of her songs include something about seeing. That's something that every time we sing a song by Fanny Crosby, uh, I hope you notice that. If you look at the author, you got the uh, author and of the music and the author of the words. Uh, she wrote a lot of words to, to songs in our songbook. Uh, there are at least a dozen, maybe up to 15 or so. Uh, but almost, almost every one, there's one song she wrote that doesn't have a reference to eyes or seeing, uh, but almost all of them do. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. It is a beautiful song, and tonight we've studied the passage where that song originated, the inspiration uh, for all of that. Moses was overwhelmed. He wanted some reassurance from God for this long journey ahead, and God arranges this scenario where he will have Moses hide in the uh, crack there in the side of the mountain, and he'll pass by behind him so that Moses can have some reassurance. So thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad that you've taken the time to be with us. Again, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something that we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give a call to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are indeed a wonderful Savior, and you have hidden us in the cleft of the rock. You've rescued us, you've reassured us tonight through your word that you are in fact with us. You are not only a God of mercy and love, but you are also a holy God. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.